how many know now? You're certain regardless. What happens? You go into heaven when you die. Raise your hand. Great. Eternal life happens to be already paid for, and we receive that. We, we accept it. That's how we get it. You don't work for it. It's impossible. It's too great a price for us to even think of earning it or having a part of it. And, of course, it was God who loved us and made that payment. You know, if I had to tell you you had to stop your smoking or drinking or join this church and pay us 20% or something like that, I couldn't do it. You wouldn't do it anyway. You wouldn't even give 1%. The thing is, God loves the world. He hates our sin and said he would take all this sin on himself and pay for it. And we could go to heaven on a righteousness that God gives us. Eternal life is a gift of God. It's paid for by God. And the only thing we can do is say, Lord, we'll accept it. We'll receive it. We believe that this payment was for us. And then you can know you have eternal life because God says so. We know this. But now then tonight we wanted to shift a little bit and talk on serving the Lord. Now there's a vast difference in serving the Lord or receiving a payment. To accept Christ as Savior, that gives you eternal life. That's the gift of God. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is... That's not life till you sin again. No, it's eternal life. Fine. We sing about in the sweet by and by. We could write another song. In the nasty here and now, we've got another condition. We've got this old body with us. It's going to give us trouble. It certainly does. To have the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, these things that God tells us, you can have and gives you the formula for it. First, it's receiving Christ. But to have these other things is obedience. Now, you'll get many lectures on how to be spiritual or to go into the deeper truths. Some people go so deep, stay so long, come up so dry. Uh, and still don't have it. Fill me, Lord! Fill me, Lord! I've used to hear people, fill me with some kind of a spirit. <laughs> Little boy standing to next to him says, don't do it, Lord, he leaks. <laughs> I, I think he's got a good point. That's not the way you're filled with the Holy Spirit. There's nothing mystical at all about getting God's blessings or being spiritual. There have been literally tens of hundreds of thousands of books written on how to be spiritual, and you might as well forget it. I can tell you how to do it with one word. And that's obedience. You obey God, you're spiritual. If you want to be punctual, just be on time. It's that simple. You're punctual. Obey God, you're spiritual. And if you obey God, you're also going to have some more promises. You see the promise of God for eternal life, you just receive that. The Lord's paid for that. But for you to serve the Lord and to be obedient, God has also got many promises to them too. He's also got some promises to them that are not obedient. Your daddy ever promise you something if you didn't do something? You clean up your room, he promises you something. If you don't clean it up, he promises you something too. You know. The Lord does that. You can obey. He has many fine things. In fact, those that obey God, God says, Your eye hasn't seen or your ear heard, neither has entered into your mind the wonderful things God has prepared for you. Not only here and now, but in the future. You know something? God also promises something to those who are disobedient. Many people say, well, I'm saved. <laughs> God's not going to kick me out. I'm not going to lose me. I live as I please. You'll find that God will not kick you out or lose you, but he might say, come on in <laughs> and work on you. Oh, not now. Oh. Yeah, he says, yeah, I know. Sure, sure. But to serve the Lord is not difficult at all. And Christ said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And that rang a bell. Now, wait a minute. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, now, wait a minute. No, that yoke's pretty heavy. That old cross to bear is pretty heavy. But now then I begin to realize, wait a minute. Christ said this and he's not lying. Now, if I've got a heavy yoke, it's really not belonging to Christ then, because Christ is light. And I begin to wonder, well, why is it so hard to live for the Lord? And I begin to find out some scriptural truths that I never realized before. Let me use a little gesture. This hand represents the first birth, flesh and blood, we'll say. 
You're all, how many here are born once? Would you raise your hand? Fine. How many have been born twice? Fine, okay, fine. fine. Okay. First birth is flesh and blood. Second birth is spirit. Now God says these are two separate births. Now when you trust Christ as Savior, you have two. If you don't, you only have one. But then he says there's going to be a battle between these two. The flesh hating the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Galatians 5, 16, 17. And he says the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. They're contrary the one to the other. You can't do the things that you would. So when we trust Christ as Savior, we have two births. How are you going to let the Holy Spirit, the new birth, control this old man? How can you do that when he fights back? I'm going to go to church. Shut up. We're going to watch Superman. And so you have a, a battle. Okay. How can you, you mean to say that's easy, man? I get awful tired of being slugged back, you know. I think I'm going to witness, yeah, and you lose your popularity. <laughs> oh, it's so hard to witness. Oh, it's so hard for the Lord. Just yes. Well, now, just how can you say it's easy to serve the Lord when I witness and I got him fighting back? Well, that's very simple. Ready? You put two boxers in a ring. They always want them about the same size and strength because they want to scrap. Kill him, Joe! Sure, get rid of them. In Christian love, of course. But this thing of, of fighting, they love to get two and match people. Then you got problems. But they would never think of putting a little old midget, a little old puny thing against a great, big, healthy, strong man like me. Just boom, one blow, and it's gone. Which man are you going to feed? You going to feed him or him? The trouble is, after you're saved, you're going to still watch the old boob too. All your companions got to smoke a little pot, you know. <laughs> Doesn't bother me. Run around with the wrong crowd, the wrong language. Feed self constantly through your eye and your ears. Filth. And you get him strong. Oh, of course you'll go to church on Sunday. Yes, I must, you know, I'm saved. Yeah. Got to go and put my 25 cents in the plate. Give God a little tip when he comes by, you know. So, so the trouble is when he says, I'm going to witness for Jesus. Shut up! And he shuts up and he says, oh, it's so hard to live for Jesus. I say, Shut up, won't you? And he can't live for Jesus. That's a great problem we have. So hard to live. Why? You've got a big one to fight. That's right. But don't blame that on God. He isn't the one that fed him at all. He gave you the new birth. He says, strengthen and feed him. House, Bible study, prayer, devotionals. Christian friendship, fellowship, talking to one another, leading people to the Lord, all these things. You strengthen him, exercise him. How many here believe you're having one of the best times you've ever had in your life? How many? Fine. Oh, fine. Okay. Fine. Fine. Oh, fine. Now, the reason, the reason they're having such a good time is we're giving them filth on the shows, rock and roll and dances and a little pot on the side and a few slugs of gin and so on. And we have a few rock and roll. No, no, no. If we had, we'd have one of the biggest messes, right, by this time, than you ever saw. More trouble, more fights, more scraps than anything you could ever dream of. More jealousy, more hatred, and more, perhaps a whole bunch of girls pregnant by this time, everything else. It's the result of feeding him. However, we're not doing that. We're feeding him. And yet we find there's some here having the best time they've ever had. Now then, by feeding him, what are we doing? About six hours of Bible study a day. Oh, the first couple of days have been kind of hard, hasn't it? Some of them already saying, oh, let's study some more. <laughs> I'm worn out. Uh, I'm not worn out. I'm just getting started. I'm just getting warmed up. You don't think so? Ask my people on Sunday. I preach two hours and sometimes three. Yeah. But the thing is this. You've been feeding him, and you're beginning to find out you can be happy. You're beginning to find out there's other guys and gals that are pretty sharp, and pretty nice. And you begin to get a better outlook on life. You begin to say, gee, I didn't know some, I've heard so many. I didn't know so many kids could be together and be so happy. Well, why? It's very simple. Getting back to this very same principle, we feed him, exercise him, and have starved him. And so consequently, he might say, don't you think you're just overdoing it a bit? 
shut up. He shuts up. Oh, but when you get outside, you can start feeding him. He gets strong in a battle. And when he starts fighting you back, don't ever say it's so hard to be a Christian. No. Whenever you feed him like God says and follow his form and strengthen him and he's weakened, you can control him and you can live a wonderful, fruitful life. And you'll like the results of come, what comes from serving the Lord. Letting God be first, obeying him, starving this old man, feeding him, and you're going to be very happy, very happy. You'll find you'll have love, joy, peace. All these things are guaranteed to those who feed him and starve him. The battle is won before the fight ever begins. It comes back in the preparation stage, what you're doing now. Getting prepared for the battle. Then staying with your own troops. Don't go over and try to have fellowship with the enemy. As a bomber pilot in the war, I'd go over and drop bombs on the enemy. But I would never land and say, boys, let's have a beer. I did a pretty good job today. <laughs> you don't do it that way. You'd come back with your own. Get more ammunition, more strength, fellowship. Go over and drop a few more, but come right back. That's the way Christians should do it. If you land and try to have fellowship, you're in troubles. In the war, they tell about this pilot who flew off on an aircraft carrier in the Navy. And he was lucky that day, and he sunk a destroyer. He actually dropped another bomb right down the smokestack of an aircraft carrier. And on the way back, he saw another uh, minesweeper, and he sunk it. And he couldn't wait to get back to tell his friends all about it. But weathered in, he couldn't find his aircraft carrier to land on. And he was just, man, here it is. I've done all this and can't even get back. But after flying lost for a long time, there's a little hole in the crowds, and he just dives through it, and he sees this aircraft carrier, and comes in, boy, lands. Whew, so happy. Pulls back the canopy, and he says, hey, man, let me tell you, and I sunk a destroyer, dropped the bomb right down the stack of this aircraft carrier, and got a mine sweep way back. The fellow that stands says, very good, very good, but make you one mistakey. That's uh, a, a problem. Uh, make one mistake. You cannot have fellowship with the other kind and do any good. You're going to find it, they'll say either you're nuts or square, and the battle will take place. It's so hard to serve the Lord. Somebody say, I'm too shy to serve the Lord. Man, I just can't speak up for Jesus. I'm too shy. I forget it. So am I. Ray, you don't sound it. No, I've overcome it. Because souls are more important to me than my being shy. When I was your age, I was so shy I had to blindfold my rubber duck so I could take a bath. I'm telling you, boy. I was, I was just kind of real inward, kind of called so-called introvert, that type of thing. But I have overcome it because I don't want people to go to hell. And by feeding him, I get a strength that I didn't know I could possess. By starving him, he overpowers him. And this is how I can live a life. Now then I can get the promises that come from obedience to God. It's one thing to say to obey God. It's another thing to have the power to do it. But you can get the power to do it by feeding and strengthening him. Exercising him. Starving him. And then you're going to find this tremendous power that the gospel has. And when you start doing it, you're going to find that Christ's yoke is easy. His burden is light. Look over in Deuteronomy 28. How many have your Bibles with you? Hold them up in the air. Great, great, that's right. Deuteronomy, way back in the Old Testament. This is on page 247 if you have the old school field text. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Look at verse 47. So good to see kids with their pens underlining these, writing down scripture, knowing it, looking it up, studying it. Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness. Now maybe they serve the Lord, but rather sour. Yeah. Serve the Lord, but the Lord takes me out with him. Everything happens to me. My rocking horse just died, and I just can't stand it. I know I've heard all the stories, I think. Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. The great things God has done for us. Well, we ought to be thrilled to death to serve him. Notice then, he won't do it. Verse 48, Therefore thou shalt serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee. Now wait. Wait. Who sends these enemies? Look, read that. Who sent the enemies? Who's going to cause you the trouble? Who sent them? The Lord. I've got enough without the Lord sending some along. I'll tell you that. Hunger, 
thirst, nakedness, want of all things, and get this, I'd underline it. He shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. You refuse to serve God and you're going to have a heavy yoke. And that's no yoke. Yeah. Christ's yoke is easy, his burden is light, but you're going to find this yoke here is a different one. Certainly by far than the one I want. I carried it for a while, and because I didn't serve the Lord, I had this yoke, but occasionally would try to witness, go to church a little bit, and then because I had all my troubles, I'd say, well, the Lord is so hard to be a Christian. All the time, it was my own fault. Blaming it on God. Oh, such a heavy cross to bear. I hear people all the time, such a heavy cross to bear. Like a woman came to my office one time. She told me, she says, Ray, I have such a heavy cross to bear. I said, well, what is it? <laughs> you know what it was? <laughs> it was her husband. <laughs> <laughs> told her, don't blame that on God. <laughs> That's not the cross of Christ. That's your own fault. You married him. Don't blame that on God. That's not a cross you bear. Christ says, take up your cross daily. This is speaking of telling people about the cross of Christ. His payment for sin. We take it up. And I find that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Look over in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Romans 12, 1. Verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Now then, stop on those two verses. Think a moment. He didn't say, I command you, I beseech you. There's a difference. In view of the mercies of God, in view of what God has done for us. God has saved us. He gives us eternal life. We're going to live with him forever. And in view of his mercy upon us, in view of these mercies of God, then you ought to present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your hard, terrible, no, which is your reasonable service. And be conformed to this world, dress like them, talk like them, wear your hair like them, wear your dresses all the way. No, that's fine. Yep, no, no. And be not conformed. That word conform means to be fashioned. And be not fashioned to this world. But be ye transformed by renewing of your mind. That, that means study your word of God constantly. Get God's word on it. And that ye may prove. That word prove is discover in the Greek. Prove means to discover. And you'll discover what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You don't know what God wants you to do? Don't be fashioned to this world. Uh, be a living sacrifice in view of God's salvation. And you will discover what God wants you to do. And you'll find that you'll love what God wants you to do. Well, Ray, how can I know God's will? Very simple. I have quite a few scriptures and things I could give you. But let me give it to you just simply. To be in the will of God is just simply to obey Him. It's that simple. You don't need some deep, dark secret to come hear my wonderful, eloquent messages and I'll tell you how to know the will of God. Let's say I told my son, son, go mow the yard. He says, Daddy, I don't feel led to. Son, go mow the yard. Oh, praise your name. Glory to you, Father. You're the best father in the world. I can't thank him. Wonderful father. What is your will for my life, Father? Son, go mow the yard. Oh, but Father, that's not my calling. I don't have a leading <laughs> to go mow the yard. What is your will? Now, of course, this is rather stupid, I know. What would be the Father's will in that case? To go mow the yard. Now, of course, if I did that and my son didn't, I've got a little something wrapped around my waist that changed things. In fact, let me say this, he would soon be in the lawn mowing business. Now God's the same way. God's the same way. Is this difficult to understand about God? And you don't believe him? <laughs> Just try and see. No man can escape. God says he chastens how many of his sons? And if that doesn't work, he does what? Scourgeth. Think it over Take your pick. I'd rather have his guidance. I'd rather do it the easy way. I found out the hard way. Nowhere. Over in John 15, if you want this, John 15, verse 8. How are you going to glorify the Father? Very simple. Bear fruit. I don't have to spend a month building up to the message to tell you something. 
You want to glorify God? Just bear fruit. We talked about that yesterday. You bear fruit. Verse 8, herein is my Father glorified, that you become a prayer warrior. That you go into all the world and install sanitary sewers. No. Herein is my Father glorified, that you praise His name daily. No. My Almighty Father glorified that you bear what? No, there's another word there. Thank you. Much fruit. Don't go away just bearing a little bit here. You don't glorify the God, Father, just glorify just a little bit. Let's see, once I remember back 20 years ago, I guess, I told someone about Jesus and they got saved. About 20 years ago, I reckon. Uh, you're not glorifying God on that, my friend. Some of you can't even say 20 years ago. Come, can't say three years. Some of you can't even say three days ago. Here does my Father glorify that you what? Bear much fruit. I know what I'm going to say now is, and what I've been saying. I know that it falls on many deaf ears. I know good and well that most of you here will never mount the hill of beans for God. I know that. I know it full well. When I say how many are here saved, oh sure, just about every hand. When I say, what do you mean, Ray, I want to mount the hill of beans for God? Exactly that. Well, why do you say that, Ray? For over 20 years, we've had youth conferences just like this one. And I know firsthand, many of them that are now dead. I know many sick, many weak. Many gone home before their time. I've seen many become giants too in the faith. Not many, a few. A few. Out of those that are here tonight, if you dedicate your life to the Lord. Out of those who dedicate their lives to the Lord, they'll start feeding him so much, he'll overpower this one, won't carry it through. They think dedication is walking an aisle, it isn't. Dedication is a day-by-day -day feeding and strengthening, studying the Word of God with other Christians in a good Bible-believing and teaching church, starving this one. He's hungry, too. All the filth to starve him, not to feed him. You can find then you can really be obedient. And that God can bless you. And you can have the things you want. To have the love you want. The joy. The patience. The peace. These things that God can give. The very things we want. I've been asked. A special request over and over. By many people. And also by uh, many notes. That Ray would you tell us about your friend Jim Tingen this evening. Well I will. I'd like to say this. It isn't too easy for me to do so. I do it because. I think it. It helps me and helps others. But this is a very sacred thing to me. Jim was a very close personal friend of mine. To describe Jim to you would be rather difficult. We were down in the old ranch building today. Looked on the wall. There burned in. Old Jim had burned his name up there where he dedicated his life. And we had let him put their name on the wall when they did. To describe Jim Tengen would be difficult. Because he wasn't the brightest person in the world. That's putting it kindly. I guess you'd say he's one who had his marbles, but his shooter was missing. That you know people like that? He wasn't bad enough to be put in an institution, but if he was in there, they'd be a little bit questionable about letting him out. His mother was an alcoholic. His father was about perhaps the nearest nothing you could ever describe. But Jim loved his folks right on. He would always ask me to witness to his mother, who was an alcoholic. But Jim, when he trusted the Lord as his Savior, the first night he ever came to ranch, he trusted the Lord. One of his eyes was a little bit off-center and scarred quite badly because as a little boy, cutting out paper dolls with his brothers and sisters. They had an accident with the scissors, and it stabbed him in the eye, and it had left this scar tissue there in his eye. May I say this to you girls? I don't think there's a girl here, Harley, who would want to date Jim Tingen. He didn't have the best clothes in the world. He was very poor, of course. In fact, most of the clothes he had were clothes I gave him. I didn't want to wear anymore, old and being somewhat larger. They never fit him very well. But something happened to this boy when he trusted Christ as his Savior. That God would love him. I guess he was a little bit shocked that someone would love Jim that much. 
that he made a payment for sins and he could have eternal life through what Christ did for him. And he'd just say over and over how much that meant to him. And he never missed a meeting at ranch. He'd always come, but he always had someone with him. Always had someone with him. And I began to think, boy, I don't know where he gets them, but if he can get them, anybody could bring someone out to the meetings. No one would date him because Jim, of course, I guess, didn't have an opportunity to take too many baths, didn't have an opportunity to have too many clean clothes, couldn't afford brute or some of these other things. And he just didn't quite, just didn't quite know how to talk to girls. They kind of had him, they'd get his tang all tangled up. He'd want to help. Anytime there was a work party, Jim Tenson was there. And he'd scare me to death. He was accident prone. If there was a bucket there, he'd put his foot in it. Every time. But I remember when we put up some snap ties on that beam of the Grove Community Church down at the southwest corner, that whole beam up there, we were pouring concrete in there and it broke. And it swelled out and we had a beam instead of about this wide, we had one about this wide and we had to chop, chip that off. All hard concrete. Who was up there? The only one I know would go up there. Old Jim would go up and straddle that beam and day after day with a hatchet, chip that thing down to where it would fit the wall. He bought a Bible. It had to be just like mine. This is an old, was when I bought it, $35 loose leaf Schofield Bible. Priceless to me now. Uh, he had to have one just like it. He really didn't know what to underline, but he would come to my house and he'd ask, Ray, can I have your Bible? What do you want with it, Jim? Because I've got personal notes in it. Ray, I just want to underline what you have underlined. Now, he didn't know why. He didn't know why I underlined things in my Bible, and you can see I've underlined quite a few things in my Bible. I love to see a good old dirty Bible. That's a used Bible. Now, the Bible is not dirty. But whatever I underlined, he would underline. He just says if Ray underlined it, it ought to be underlined. I'd even tell Sue, I said, Sue, if Jim comes and wants my Bible, it's all right. Don't let anyone else have it. But if he wants it, just let him. He'd come in by the hour and sit there and underline things in the Bible. Now, a boy in this condition who wasn't well liked, he was a pest. Do you know what I mean by a pest? He would just hang around all the time, always want to talk to you at the busiest times. He just loved me. I can say this almost like a dog on the farm. Why I led him to the Lord. And because I guess I was one of the few that was kind to him would put up with it. I understood him. But when he'd come to the ranch and I began to see what this boy was doing, my heart went out to him, I tell you. He would never come alone. I remember he'd bring all kinds to the ranch. I remember some hoods he brought there. <laughs> hoods, whoo. I remember one night he brought two on motorcycles, two boys and their dates on the back of a motorcycle. Of course, I had a motorcycle and he had talked to him, told about how we used to race motors at Daytona and so on. And yeah, and so and so they'd come over to the house and we led them to the Lord. One week later, these motorcycles were racing down 27th Avenue in Miami. A train was coming, those big gates come down. They says, let's beat it. And they, one guy went ahead and beat it, but the other one didn't. The gate came down, caught him at the head, and they skidded over a block on the motorcycle, actually decapitated the girl in the boy's head as he scraped along the curb, wore off part of his skull, and his brains were laying on the sidewalk. Right in front of the Screwball Bar on 27th Avenue. Some of you adults remember the Screwball Bar on 27th Avenue? Some of you, raise your hand. Remember the bar? Some of you do. Not to go in it, but you know what I'm talking about. I won't admit that. Right near the railroad track. I've seen them bring in others in the highest society. I remember one time, just about supper time, a man came to the door, dressed real nice, tie, coat, businessman, driving a beautiful car. Knocked the door, came, I didn't know who he was. He came up and said, sir, he says, is your name Ray Stanford? I said, yes, it is. He said, I'd like to speak with you, but I see that you have dinner. I'll come back some other time. I says, no, I'd be glad. Come on, why don't you come in? You know, when people come to your door, you never know. The Lord has got purpose. He says, I really, it's difficult for me to tell you why I'm here. I, uh, 
I'm a Sunday school teacher over at Shenandoah Presbyterian Church. And that interests me because I used to be a Sunday school teacher at Shenandoah Presbyterian Church and was a deacon there for many years. And so I said, well, come right in. I used to teach Sunday school there myself. Oh, did you? You're fine. Can I have a seat? He said, well, the reason I'm here is a young boy was hitchhiking, and I can't even remember his name. But he told me that salvation was without works, and I've always thought that was some works in it, and he tried to help me in the Bible. He said he, he couldn't do it too well. He said, if I'd come here, you could explain it to me. He says, but I don't even remember his name. I said, sorry, it's Jim Tingen. Yeah, that's it. How did you know? I said, don't know. It's more about it. I know about it. I lead the man to the Lord. It's nice to have a Sunday school teacher to have to know, know the Lord. That's good. They can help others. Uh, I can't explain all the people. I remember one time he brought a big fat colored lady. You couldn't reach around her. I didn't try, but I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, a very fine person. Jim had just stopped talking, started talking to her, and she couldn't quite understand him. He brought her over. Now, whenever Jim brought in a friend, or someone he was witnessing to, he would take over the whole house. He would take them to the refrigerator. Help yourself. Just go right ahead. These, these people love the Lord. You can have anything they've got. And just sit down and he'd just serve them everything I had. And he knew it would be perfectly all right. But if he came in himself, he wasn't that way. Very meek. Just follow around. Can I have Ray's Bible and sit in the corner? Right. One time he sat on all my favorite records and broke them. <laughs> That's the way Jim did it, though. I mean, just somehow, and I come down and I... I started to say something, Jim, what are you sitting on my favorite records? But you know, I didn't dare. He says, Ray, I'm so sorry, I'll pay for them. I didn't tell him these were priceless, you couldn't even buy them, I couldn't even get any more like them. And that was before they had the kind that were unbreakable, they were just the kind you usually put up in the old place where you throw baseballs at them and break them. I just said, no, Jim, don't worry, it's perfectly all right, and let it go. I remember one time, he would hitch Jim always hitchhiked. The reason why, he says, Ray, I get in the car and they're taking me. They can't leave, so I can tell them about Jesus. <laughs> and he would believe me. He'd hitchhike. He'd go up to North Carolina where his home was. His folks went up there and it's where their residence was. California. And he'd hitchhike, but he always had his dog with him. Great big dog king, he called him. It's big. Great big police dog. The dog loved him. When he hitchhiked, he always took his dog with him. I remember one time he came back from California. I'm serious as I can be. He came running out. Hey, Ray. Hey, Ray. Hey, I got some people out here. Won't you? Wait? And I look out the back door in that lot, and so hope, Hannah, goodness sakes. They had a car and a trailer out there. It looked like a bunch of Okies. They had mattresses and springs on top. Little children running around there with running noses. It's kind of hard to describe some of them. And just, it was rather sick. <laughs> Ray, you come on out. I said, they don't have a place to stay. And you know how I got them here? I told them they could park here and stay here as long as they wanted to. And so you can tell them about Jesus. <laughs> how are you going to explain that to your elders? I says, Jim, there's a city ordinance here. You can't park trailers in the city lots here. You've got to have sanitary facilities, lights. Jim, they can't stay here. Ray, they don't know Jesus. Told them they could. I found out they had picked him up way out in Kansas somewhere, and they didn't have any money either. He had even bought the gas for them to come all the way to mine. See, and I know where you can stay and park your trailer. How can you run people like that off? So we had them park it over in those oak trees, you know, that lot. And we tried to hide it as well as we could. And so I'd, he says, Ray, now they don't know Christ come talk. I go talk to them. They wouldn't trust Christ. The woman kind of sounded like she did, but he just wouldn't. I got him. I says, Jim, you've got to tell him to leave now. They can't. Ray doesn't know Jesus. I kept on, boy, after two or three days. I got my Bible, and I got down on both knees. I said, Lord, let me lead these people to the Lord. I went on and spent a couple of hours. The man trusted the Lord. Really did. Got squared away. He was so happy. That night, Jim came over, saw him, and he came back and says, Ray, you can tell him to leave now. He's saved. <laughs> Drove up in front of my house a huge tractor trailer. I mean, it's a big, you know, big cab, and behind it, one of those huge trailers. I mean, a big one. Charlie Burgess, you know what I mean. I mean, that thing was a 50-footer. It was a huge, long thing. You could hear the air brakes squealing up in front of my house. I look out there, and I says, great, Scott, I wonder what Sue's bought now, you know. <laughs> and uh, here comes Jim. <laughs> he run out, hey, Ray, hey, come on. 
Oh, brother. Truck driver sitting in now, and he had tattoos on him. Great big guns. Ray, come on. I've been talking about Jesus, and I, I told him to come by here and explain to him. I'd get my Bible, and I'd kind of, oh, brother, here I go again, you know. But this man was ready. I go out and I start telling him. He says, you know, uh, he's trying to tell me something about Christ. He said, if come here, he'd explain it. Oh, yes, sir. Let me tell you, here you are, and here's sin. God loves you, he hates sin. Here's Christ who's sinless. And because he loved you, pay for your sin, just ride down the line, tell him. Well, it's very simple. In a few minutes, this truck driver trusted the Lord as a Savior. And you know what he told me? He says, sir, he says, you know, I drive trucks all the time. and get awful sleepy in the road, and sometimes I doze off, and I've run off the road. I've been near many accidents. He said, often on the road, I see many accidents where people are killed. And I've just had a fear, you know, someday I would just go to sleep from driving too long and just be killed. And I've often wondered where I was going to go when I died. He said, I haven't been sleeping. I've been so worried about this. And I was worried about it. And I saw this boy hitchhiking. And I picked him up. And he started telling me about this, that I could know I have eternal life when I died. And he says, he said, if I came by here, you could explain it. He says, I appreciate it so much. <laughs> the truck driver got a little tear coming his eye. Wasn't sobbing, just, just moisture, just tears dropping occasionally from his eye. He says, I can't thank you enough. Well, when I started to leave, I said, sir, you know, I may never see you again. But God, but, oh, he says, I'll see you in heaven. I felt rather rebuked. And he drove away. He wanted to lead his brother to the Lord so bad. Now his brother was older. And he got tired of Jim telling him about Jesus. He looked on Jesus as kind of a, uh, Jim's kind of a half moron. His name was Bob Tengen. And then it got to where it was so, so by him so much that he had often beat him up. He said, every time you talk about Christ, I'll just beat you up. And he did. Often Jim would come with bruises, beaten up. And, Jim, what happened to you? No. Brother, get you again. Ray, I'd just do anything if my brother could trust the Lord. I just, I'd give him my life if my brother could trust the Lord. He had loved people like that. You know, I'll never forget, sometimes I'd be asleep in the middle of the night. And Jim would come and start, throw, I lived on the second floor back of the ranch, and I'd feel rocks hitting my windows. Clank! Clank! What in the world? And I'd say, yep, Jim's out there throwing rocks at my window. One time he got the hose and shot on it. it was, I said, great, Scott, it's raining. I go up there. Had to get up, but rain would come through the jalousies. Jim was out there. Hey, Ray, Ray, come down. Let's talk to somebody. One morning, now my wife will tell you this, I never get up and read the paper. Up here, I don't even buy the paper anymore. I just quit reading the paper. I've read all the news 2,000 years ago. The paper's a little late. But occasionally, uh, we the paper come, and sometimes I'd get to read a little of the headlines. But I never get up in the morning and read the paper. If I did, I'd read my Bible. But often I'll read up around 3 or 4, get up 3 or 4 in the morning, just get my Bible and read it, just study it, because there's no telephones ringing. I get a time to do a little, what you might say, creative thinking. And if you're disturbed, it takes away from it. This morning I wake up, it's about daylight, and I try to read my Bible, and it's just a dull, I couldn't. I try to read a couple of books. Just, all of a sudden it hit my mind, Ray, why don't you go down and get the paper and see what's got to say this morning? So I get up and go downstairs. And now, I have to tell you this. I don't like to, but uh, I don't like to give away personal secrets, but it's part of the story. I sleep in my underwear. That's what it is. <laughs> so I'm going to the front door, and I don't have any other clothes on. I'm just underwear. And, but now, remember, it's early. Just gray, you know, kind of just no cars coming by. And I open the door and look up and down to see if any cars come real quiet. Paper's laying just, just right there, you know. I could see it. And I look up and down, so I... Run over there and get it. There he is! Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Run back in the house. I tell you the truth, Jim Tenyon, but sitting over there on that rail with a boy. And I hear this shout, there he is. So I run back, and as I run back to the door to get in with kind of trying to cover myself with the paper, but it's rolled up and it doesn't do too good. You know, so. And Jim says, wait, 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 don't you talk. I said, well, let me put my pants on. <laughs> I go upstairs, and Sue says, Ray, what in the world is that? I says, Jim Tenyon downstairs with a boy. Oh, she says, that figures. <laughs> <laughs> I put my pants. Didn't even bother to put a shirt on. That's my barefooted and a T-shirt. my pants. This boy comes in. 
and I talked to him. It wasn't too long till he accepted Christ as his Savior. You know, the interesting part of this is what that boy told me. He said, you know, Jim has been trying to get me to come over here for over a year. But he says, I'm Roman Catholic. Until he trusted Christ, he said, you know, it's a mortal sin. But he says, I'm not a strong Roman Catholic, and I could have come, but I just used that as an excuse. He says, I just didn't want to come. He said, he's kept after me and after me to come over here, and I wouldn't come. You know, Steve, your testimony tonight, I love that. What you say, don't ever give up. How long did they ask you to come? Was it over a year? Hmm? Two years before they got this Jew out there. Well, Roman Catholics are not as hard-headed as a Jew, I guess. Huh? Don't ever give up. Listen to what Steve said. Uh, many people are saved because people just wouldn't give up. So often say, I'd bring him to ranch, but I ask him, he won't come. You never ask him again. Keep pounding him. Jim got him out. This boy said, I wouldn't come. And he told me how Jim got him out. You see, Jim could scheme. Now, he might not have been the brightest person in the world, but he wanted to get people saved. He could think, you know, you can do the same thing. When you really want something, you can get it. If you, boy want, if you old girls want to get a boyfriend, you know just how to do it. You don't have to take lessons. You go up and kind of... <laughs> What's he expect? You got something in your eye? No, you just know how to do it. Look at those strong muscles you have. <laughs> muscles probably about as big around as a shoestring. Or something. <laughs> you know, there's ways and means, you and, you and I know it. Well, Jim would do this. He told me. He said, he'd been after me, he wouldn't. says, I've got a paper out. He had a paper out. How many boys here ever deliver papers? Uh, you'll know what I'm talking about better. You get up early in the morning, boy, and sometimes it's cold, and you have to roll them and tie them and then drive and throw them. But it's, it's rough. It's so nice to have someone help you, isn't it? Either to roll and to drive, and that's just you stand and throw, boy, and try to hit the mailbox and try to break out a window or whatever you're trying to do. It's so nice to have help. Jim says, listen, would you like for me to help you with your paper route? The boy says, you kidding? Sure I would. I'll do it with one condition. Oh, what's that? After we deliver the papers, you come over and talk to my friend. You mean that religious guy? Yeah. You mean, you, you will come help me, though? Yeah, sure. Okay, buddy, I sure go over and see him. Sure will, go away after the paper. And he got up early in the morning and helped him deliver papers. That's how I got him out. And he got out and delivered the paper out, and they had come and finished and were sitting on that little brick wall out in front of the old ranch down there together, and they had just sat down. And he turned to Jim and he says, Jim, how's Ray going to know we're here? Oh, he'll know. He says, let's just pray. And Jim bows his head in simple faith, Lord, send Ray down. And right then I bust out the door in my underwear. There he is! <laughs> I'll tell you. Don't you think the Lord can't answer prayer? Let's. He brought another fellow around there. Also his name was Jim. And when he brought him, he, he kind of had a build like little Abner. Broad shoulders, little thin hips, brown as a berry. And he was wearing those pants when they stuck up about to here, cut off about in here. I don't know what you call those jodpers. What? Clam diggers or, you know, that type. He had on those things. Barefooted. The only thing he had on was those clam diggers. That's all. Except for one brass earring hanging from one ear, pierced ear. Brown as a berry. Beady black eyes. He comes in, Ray, introduce me to him. He's a friend of mine. Looked, I could tell he was casing the joint. Want to steal something. You know, I tried to tell him about the Lord, and while I'm trying to tell him, we had a lot of Coke kids. We have given away free Cokes at all our ranch meetings for over 20 years. Pepsi Cola ought to take one of their caps and pin it on me for selling so many. Never charge for them, just always three Pepsi. Free Pepsi. Hear about it? One boy drank eight Pepsis, burped seven up. Yeah. But the, uh, that, uh, we, uh, we had all these Coke bottles there in the cases. He reached over, and he took a Coke bottle in each hand, which was in the case, and just stood right on his head, straight up in there, holding on those two Coke bottles this way. I'm down there kind of, hey, look, friend. Hey, down about the Lord. Finally, he says, okay, I'll trust Jesus. I wouldn't have given you two cents for his sincerity. I didn't know. About a week later, 
a bucket of bolts drives up in the front yard, and I mean it was a bucket of bolts, brother. <laughs> Look out there, wonder what in the world, and they start piling out of that thing like clowns out of a car at a circus. You have never seen such a bunch of hippies before hippies' time. That was when they called them bums. And they start coming out. You should see some of the girls the way they dress in. One of them had slacks that tight. I don't know whether she was outside getting in or inside getting out. There's some of them around here about the same way. And so it come in there. She was chewing gum. A couple of these other black belts. And then they use big, wide black belts. These things. Real hoods. And I, I, I saw him soon. I said, right, and here was this guy, Jim. You know what I did? I got my Bible. I said, Sue, don't let him in. Lock the door after me. And I went outside and met him outside. And that was a carport then where I used to keep my motorcycle. Then they closed it in. We needed the room and put my motorcycle out in the cold. But I'd go out there and had a big ping pong table that we had made out of two before's with a plywood on the top because they make it heavy because they get really a rough treatment. And so I go out there and just kind of stand on my Bible, just kind of as last defense, you know. Must have been, I don't know, eight, nine, I don't know, a whole bunch of them. Oh, Jim, he, come out, he says, sit on that table. And they just like little, little babies just begin to sit on the table. And when he got them all on the table, I didn't know what to say. I was just standing there with my Bible trying to look holy or something. I was Got them all on the table. He turned around to me, Ray, give them your religious talk. <laughs> oh, boy. Yes, sir. <laughs> here you are, and here's sin, and right through the whole bit, oh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, John 3, 16, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. You know, we have, went through the whole thing. I was afraid to ask him to trust Christ. I just told the whole story, and why not kind of seem to be just kind of a pause in it. James came up and says, all right, you trust Christ as your Savior. Okay, Jim, if you say so. <laughs> You do it. One after another, right down the line. Every one of them. Okay, sure. Yeah. Okay, yeah. This was his gang. I didn't know that. They'd been stealing more stuff, tearing up parts of cars, selling it, throwing the rest in the Coral Gables waterway. After this, he, they trust the Lord. He says, all right, get in. They all got back in the car and he drove off. A few days later, he came back and he had in his hand a bridle, a, 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 the bit that goes on a horse's mouth. A stirrup, a couple of things on a horse. It says, Ray, I want to give you these because on the ranch wall we had a lot of early American horsey things hanging around the wall. He says, I want to give you these to put on the wall to remember me by. I said, Jim, no, this is not Jim Tingen. This is with his friend. I says, give me to remember you by. Uh, where are you going? <laughs> he says, I'm giving myself up. I'm going to Rayford. I said, you're kidding. His name was Jim Peacock. I said, what are you going to Rayford for? He said, well, I've been dodging the draft and <laughs> stealing a few things. and just going to get myself up. No one ever told him, you're a bad boy, Jim. No one ever told him, give yourself up. It's a peculiar thing when you trust Christ as your Savior and have the new birth of what begins to take place in your life. And here he did. He gave himself up and went to Rayford for three years. He wanted to lead his brother to the Lord so bad. He began to scheme. How could he do it? His brother beat him up. He couldn't talk about the Lord. You know what he did? He came, Ray, I've got it. I've got it. you got what? He says, I know how to get my brother to know Christ. He says, what? He says, let's lead his best friend to the Lord. We lead his best friend to the Lord, and he'll listen to his best friend. <laughs> well, Jim, that's good, but how are we going to lead his best friend to the Lord? Don't worry. I'll get him by. Oh, ye of little faith. One day, here comes a taxi cab. And see, his, boy, his brother's best friend drove a cab. And I go out. Ray, come out. Come quick. I got him. I got him. You got who? Oh, my brother's best friend. I tell you about him. I looked out. I said, Jim, is he the cab driver? Yeah, yeah, he drives a cab. I says, did you tell him why he's here? I, Ray, this is so important. I, I, I just messed this up. And. I thought I'd better let you handle the whole thing. You come on, says it. <laughs> oh, brother, you ever go out to cab driver who just got out of Rayford? Try to tell him about the... I go out, the flag's still up. He's still drawing. Jim's paying time. I'd get him there. He waited until he found him driving by in the cab, looked all the time, got in the cab and paid the fare out there and told him, wait, I'll pay your fare. Just wait. I'll be back. And that's when he ran and got me. 
So I go out there, oh my goodness, I had to. And I do my best to lead the Lord. I begin to talk to him and talk to him and talk to him. And finally, when I started here, I brought out my wallet. I said, you know, God loves you. He hates your sin. He paid for it. He says, you know something? He says, I've been up in Rayford, and a boy up there in Rayford has been showing me about that. I says, yeah, his name's Jim Peacock. How'd you know? <laughs> I says, because Jim Peacock trusted the Lord as his Savior. And we began to talk to him. He shut the meter off. He came in the house, and I showed him the bridle and, and stuff that Jim Peacock had given him before he had left. He trusted the Lord as his Savior. We, and Mrs. Morgan, you all know Mrs. Morgan. She's the director of our music here, one of the finest Christian ladies you ever heard in your life. A wonderful Christian voice and testimony. I love her dearly. For over four years, we taught a, a Christian youth ranch Bible study in her home. Many trusted the Lord as her Savior there. My secretary right now, Carol Seymour, trusted the Lord as her Savior there. Quite a few had trusted the Lord at this Morgan's Bible study. Literally thousands, really. Well, Jim always came. But remember, he always brought somebody. Jim didn't come alone. He says, Ray, I know it, but he would bring somebody. How'd he do it? Well, here maybe give you a little secret. He came this night, and we had already started the Bible study. The song service was over. I was there teaching the Bible. They're all around on the floor. And it opens the door in Jim. Hi, Jim. But two good-looking young men with him, college age. These two college age men come in there with him, sharp looking. The minute they came in and they looked around, they see Bibles. And they see this Bible in my hand, and I could see them hesitate. And I could see them kind of want a boat. I knew good and well Jim hadn't told them what was there. He told them it was a party. That was the way Jim do it, boys and girls, party. And I could see him, so I said, sir, sit right there. And they looked at me rather funny, and they sat right there. Quite often people just don't know what to do, so just tell them. They often do it, you know. They set out. So he said, and at the, at the invitation to receive Christ as Savior, with heads bowed, eyes closed, to raise hands, one raised his hand to trust Christ as his Savior. The other one didn't. And after this meeting, I went to talk to him immediately. And this fellow definitely, oh, he got really just saved. He really believed it. And his friend, the one that didn't raise his hand, told me, he says, I'm so ashamed. He said, sir, I know Christ is my Savior because I asked him. And he says, this is my friend. We've been friends for years, but I've never told him about Christ. And he was the one going to bolt and run. Well, you know how Jim got him out? Let me tell you. That night, Jim had called all of his friends, everyone he knew. Didn't have many friends. They didn't. Too, it was a pest. No one would come with him. He called every girl he ever knew. They wouldn't come. He got on his bicycle, and he drove around to the city parks where they were having softball games at night. They have a league there in Miami. And he'd go in the stands. Would you want to go to a party? Anybody want to go to a party, boys and girls? Anybody? That's a rather stupid way to do it, but that's what he did. No one would come. Broken hearted, he was riding down 79th Street in front of the 79th Street Art Theater. You know what I mean, the X movies, this type of filth. He's driving right in front, right there on the sidewalk, and here these two young men come out of the thing. He skids his brakes. Hey, how would you all like to go to a party, boys and girls? You kidding? No, uh, some good-looking girls. They said, lead the way. They got in the car, and he held on the side of the car, which is not the safest thing in the world, with his bicycle, and took them to Morgan's. And that's when they popped through the door. And when they saw the Bible and tried to leave, and they told me, says, we are ashamed. Says, I've never been ashamed. Said, we went to 79th Street Art Theater. We saw him, and that's why we got there. Man, you know, I told you his mother was an alcoholic. And he loved his mother, and he kept asking me, Ray, come talk to Mama, come talk to Mama. I said, I will sometime, will sometime, busy. You know, you ever talk to an alcoholic? Very difficult. I've led quite a few to the Lord. They're very difficult. Very difficult for them to give up the habit, even when they know the Lord. Well, one time we were sitting down at the supper table. I hadn't eaten any lunch that day. I'd run out with just a quick, just a little glass of milk for breakfast. Sue had some delicious pork chops. I can smell them yet. Well done, just a mile, everything just boiled, just put it right on the table. Jim come to the front door, on the front door. Says, Ray, well, come in, Jim. Says, Ray, would you come talk to Mama? She's sick, she doesn't feel good. Had cancer now. Says, Ray, the doctor tells me, said, I hadn't told Mama she's dying of cancer. Would you come talk to Mama? Goodness sakes, what are you going to do? Say nothing. 
I could have said, Jim, I'm sorry. Worked hard all day. We've been serving the Lord. I'm sorry. It's my supper. I'm just going to just have to wait some other time. I'm so glad. I don't know what would happen if I remembered that. It's not what I said. I said, Sue, just put it in the oven. I find sometimes the greatest blessings come when it costs you the most. Sometimes those you lead the Lord under hard circumstances, you have to give up something to do it. Sometimes, you know what happened? So Sue put it in the oven. We got in the car and drove out. He lives right out near where the Coca-Cola plant is there in Miami. Very poor section. House, very small. We went up to the front door. It was locked, but you could see right through the living room to the bedroom. It was right there, and you could see the light on. And the door was locked. Jim goes up the front door. Oh, mama, mama, guess what? Ray's here. Ray's just like he's saying Jesus Christ had come or something. It just, 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 Jim just was so... He just couldn't thank me ever enough for leading him to the Lord. And I heard this raucous whiskey voice. He can't come in. The house is a mess. Tell him to go away. And Jim, you could just see him wilt. He said, wait, Ray, wait. He runs around to the back of the house and comes in the back door. And I could hear him talk, Mama, please let him in. So I'm not going to do my mess. I'm sick in the bed. I can't understand. I can't see people. So I wasn't about to leave, <laughs> waste my pork chop dinner over just a false trip. So I call and I says, Miss Tension, I says, Jim tells me you're sick and I want to come out and have a word of prayer with you. I says, he loves you and we just want to have a brief word of prayer with you and then we'll leave. Is it all right if I come in for just a moment? She said, well, well, all right, for just a minute. Jim came run, opened the door and I went in and we started talking about the Lord and boy, believe me, when you're dying of cancer and you're this sick, people begin to want to know. I said, I know you're sick, Miss Tenjan, but you know a wonderful thing? We're all going to have a perfect body someday. You never know sickness. Oh, yeah, Jim talks about that, but I've been trying. I don't have a new body, and so we don't know. But you know, it wasn't too long. We told her the simple old story of God loving her and paying for her sin. Giving her. It wasn't too long she trusted the Lord as her Savior. You know, how do I know? Well, I don't guess you can really ever know for sure, but I'll tell you this. For the next two weeks, she was on the phone two or three times a day running my wife me crazy, asking questions. You know where in the Bible say there's also in the Bible? Just thrilled to death with her salvation. You know, two weeks after this, she was killed by an automobile in front of the railroad station there on 7th Avenue crossing the street. She got up to go buy some, I guess, wine. And they had killed her, the car had killed her. I often wonder what I would have said to Jim if I'd said, Jim, I'm sorry, I'm going to stay and eat my supper. You know, they couldn't find Jim to tell him that his mother was killed. His brother tried to find him. He couldn't. He called the house. He couldn't find him. You know who found him? The cab driver. The best friend looking for Jim found him. He asked me some places to go. I told him, but he found him. This time, the flag's down. No charge. And he brings Jim, and Jim's sobbing as if his heart would break. Ray, Mama's gone. Mama's gone. Mama's gone, Ray. And I says, Jim, but it's so great to know she's with the Lord. She kind of stole a march on us, Jim. She's, she's gone to be with Jesus before we do. And I says, Jim, look how good it is. She's dying of cancer. The Lord's certainly been merciful to take her without any pain suddenly, quickly. She probably didn't even know what hit her. And Jim would say, yes, but Ray, I'm going to miss her so bad. And he would just sob in my arms. Those things are difficult to remember, but yet there's a deep, deep, I guess life is made up of some things like that. But you know, after this, he asked me if I would conduct his mother's funeral service, and I told him, oh, what an honor. We held the services there at the Reed Gaultier Funeral Home on Flagler Street. His brother was there. He says, Ray, now you can lead my brother to the Lord. His best friend knows the Lord, and we know the Lord. And boy, at the funeral service, I told a lot of the things. And not a lot of the, I told the things about the mother, about how we'd gone to see her, how we'd gone and talked to her, how she trusted the Lord just two weeks before, and how she'd called on the phone, gave the plan of salvation, and gave an invitation. And there were quite a few trusted the Lord. But his brother sat there. You could just see hate and venom coming out of his eyes. After the funeral service, I didn't see Jim. About a week. And I thought that was so strange. So 
Many had trusted the Lord and knowing Jim, I don't know what had happened. When Jim came up, he was black and blue, and I was one eye was almost swollen shut, completely purple. I says, Jim, what happened? Uh, I says, Yeah, your brother beat you up this something. And he just sobbed like a baby. Oh, I found out what his brother said. He says, yeah, this crackpot evangelist who's just in for the money over there and all those things. Yeah, he just ruined my mother's funeral. Said have a funeral service and wonderful thing. He says he goes up there just as an evangelist and all this. And he beat his brother to a pulp. You know, that's kind of hard to take. Sometimes you kind of want to go over and <laughs> kind of let your old nature rear up, you know. He says, Ray... If it takes my life, I want my brother to trust. I'd give my life to have my brother saved. I don't think we have a burden quite like that so many times. You know? I wonder how many times you persisted and got someone out to ranch or felt that way about your family or your brother. You know, the story doesn't end there, of course. Jim hitchhiked to North Carolina to get some treatment of his eye. His eye began to get infected, the one that was stabbed with the scissors when he was a boy. We didn't see Jim for a few weeks, and he came back. His eye was quite inflamed, and he had been up taking cortisone shots. Because of the infection in his eye, they couldn't operate, and they were giving him cortisone, very heavy doses, because of being near the brain and the infection. As they just said, it was so dangerous to give him cortisone. But you know, the night he came back, he had two kids with him. They trusted the Lord as their Savior. I'd like to know who they are. I can't remember. I just don't. Remember, I don't know who they were. But little Robin Davis, Tommy Davis's little girl, was there with the chicken pox. And Jim picked up a little girl just like he's want love little kids. Jim caught the chicken pox. I didn't see Jim for about a week or ten days, didn't even know what had happened to him. And sometime afterwards, and I get a call from the hospital. You Ray Stanford? Yes. Do you know Jim Tingen? Yes. Well, he's over here in isolation. He's a very sick boy. He would like to see you. Got on my motor and ran over quick. And Jim was in isolation. And I had chicken pox. I never knew chicken pox could do something like this to an adult. The children, it's just a little child of disease, nothing at all, a young person. But somehow the cortisone shots he had been taking reacted with the chicken pox. And there wasn't a place on his body that you could touch without touching a big purple spot. that would be as big around as any of your little fingers, some of them smaller, some larger. Just covered absolutely covered to go inside I had to put on a gown and a mask and all these things look like Dr. Kildare whoever's the current TV star in the thing just to go into the room an isolation ward there we sit down and talk to him and he just wept and says Ray I'm so sorry I look so bad I says Jim you don't look bad you know I'm kidding we'll talk to him I says Jim is there anything I can do for you mm hmm what do you want? Would you tell my brother to come see me? Well, I did. I called his brother. Brother doesn't like me too well, as you guessed by this time. The brother just swore over the phone. I find out Jim had been at his home. He got taken very ill with the chicken pox. They wouldn't even call a doctor. They said, just chicken pox, just make yourself out an idiot. In a tremendous fever and trouble, he stumbled down the stairs, fell, grabbed the phone, and had to call the police. He'd call the police, and the police had come out, and they in turn had called the ambulance to get him to the hospital. He says he's just putting on his brother. Wouldn't go see him. I went to see him, prayed for him. A couple of days later, got another call from the hospital. Said, "Sir, if you want to see Jim Tingen alive again, you better come quickly." I raced over there. I couldn't understand on a cap and gown, go in the room. This black nurse there was so nice. She was taking his blood pressure when I came in. He's in a coma. Came in, she looked at me. And of course, she had seen me there several times. And she just looks up and smiles, and she just shakes her head. Says, watch his blood pressure. She just mumbled something just over nothing. She didn't have any. He was breathing just kind of like this, kind of. Just practically hardly any breath at all. And I uh, sat down and reached down and took his hand. I says, Jim, 
You're going to steal a march on me, son. You're going to go see Jesus before I do. You'll be with your mama. And all of a sudden he starts breathing just as normal as you and I do. This nurse's eyes got big as saucers. She's looking, looking over at this. Don't you tell me Jim didn't know what I'm saying. I know good and well he knew what I was saying. He knew it was me. I think he was just holding out and waiting until I got there. The nurse runs, gets the doctor. And he comes in. And I thought one more time would play the game. Jim and I would play so many times because often when he'd bring people and they'd not know what they're coming for, he kind of just don't go up and start talking. But Jim would ask the most leading questions. He'd have his friend he just brought in for this purpose. Didn't even tell him what he brought him for. And I wouldn't have to worry about opening the conversation. He'd just start out and say, Ray, you studied the Bible a lot. Can you really know you have eternal life now? Well, yes, Jim, you can. It's, it said so in the Bible right over here. And I just happened to have my Bible. And we'd go talk to Jim. This other guy sitting over here with big ears, you know, listening. So I'd go over the whole thing with Jim. And, well, how can you be sure? Does it really say it's not of works? And, of course, Jim knew this as well as I did. So we'd, we'd do that, play that game. I guess some of you played the same game. I reached out as I was holding his hand there and talking to the doctor come in. He looks at Jim breathing. He reaches out and takes his pulse. <laughs> Heart's beating his wham right away. So I thought we'd play a game. I says, Jim, you're going to be Jesus before I do. But I says, the wonderful thing is you know you have eternal life. That Christ paid for all your sins. And you know that when you die and stand before God, you're going to be as righteous as he is. Because I couldn't use the hand gesture very well in the play in this game because Jim was there. The doctor thought in a coma. But we stand, he never opened his eyes. But we stand there, and as I'm telling all this, holding my hand, boy, let me tell you, we went through the whole plan of salvation. The doctor stands there just like he just someone hit him with an axe. Just stand there and listen. Afterwards, we, the doctor, he trusted the Lord as his Savior. The nurse said they trusted the Lord as their Savior. And Jim died. He went to be with the Lord. Well, I had the funeral service, yes. The same place we buried his mother. Reed go out to their funeral home there on Flagler. And his brother was there. Now, I'm not bitter. I'm not vindictive against people. But I had been a little bit sore at him for beating up Jim all these years. And he had just bothered me. He had been so nasty and cursed at me on the phone so much about him going to see his brother Jim in the hospital when he was begging for him. I says... Bob, I says, you may curse at me, but I says, your brother's very ill, and he, the only thing he wants is for, to see his brother. Well, let me tell you this at the funeral. You know, the kids use an expression today, let it all hang out. I says, brother, this may be the last time I'll ever get a shot at him, but I'm going to let it all hang out. And that this funeral service was different than any funeral service you've ever been to because I told pretty much the stories I've told it here tonight. Are there any here that were at that funeral service? There are, raise your hand. Is there a few here at that funeral service? There's a couple of hands. There's one back here and one over here. Funeral service. I can tell you it was quite an unusual funeral service. And his brother Bob sat over in the family room and sobbed like a baby, crying his heart out. I told about his brother beating him up. I told him about how Jim said that he would die if it would be the Ray brother would trust the Lord as his Savior and if it took his life, that it would be fine with him if his brother would only trust Christ as his Savior. Let me say this, the invitation I gave at the funeral home, his brother was the first one to raise his hand. And after the service, we talked to him at some length. Well, we buried him. A few days later, about three days after the funeral, his brother came to my office there at Grove Community Church. He looks an awful lot like Jim, except he died better looking than Jim, had more intelligence. Came in and he had Jim's Bible, exactly like mine. My Bible was getting pretty worn, and here was a perfect opportunity for me to have a Bible underlined just like mine. He says, Ray, we don't have much money in our home. We have about four or five kids. We had also led his wife to the Lord. She wasn't a wife for a long time, but having children they decided to get married and 
He says, I want you to have Jim's Bible. I was stunned, you know. I don't know of anything I'd rather have. Something you just can't buy. I says, no. I said, you better keep it. No, you have it. He was a little disturbed because I was talking about the Lord. He was even thinking about going to Bible college, even about going to Christian service. A few days later, it got on my mind. I called him up. I said, Bob, I want to see you. Come to my office. I want to see you. He did. He came by. I said, Bob, you have four boys. I says, they never will know their Uncle Jim or young. But I says, you want to do something for me? I'm going to tell you. I'm going to ask a favor. You said I could ask any favor and you do it for me? I says, I'm going to ask you a favor. And that's to take Jim's Bible and you go back and every day you read your son a portion of Jim's Bible. Read what Jim underlined in his Bible. And I want you to tell your children this is your Uncle Jim's Bible and he underlined this. And I want you to read what he underlined. He says, Ray, I will. He took the Bible. We were in touch for, oh, I guess a year. But then we didn't see him hardly anymore. You know, about, about a couple of years ago now, before we left the old ranch, I heard a knock on the door, and I went to the door, and I was shocked because I would have sworn it was Jim Tension. It was two young men standing there, two young boys. And they says, you won't know me. And I says, yes, I would. You're Bob Tension's boys. Come in. How did you know? I says, you're a spitting image of your Uncle Jim. They come in, showed Jim where he branded his name on the wall and sit down. And we led him to the Lord. I couldn't help but think one of them was easy to trust the Lord, the other one wouldn't. And I told him, I says, Uncle Jim gave his very life so your daddy could trust the Lord. And boy, after we talked to him a while and he trusted the Lord as his Savior, why... I couldn't help but go over and kind of rub the old name on the wall, you know. You know, these things are, as I say, you can see why they're perhaps a little difficult to tell. I'm not an emotional person. Sometimes, though, I think we don't have some emotion. True devotion can bring emotion, and I think something's wrong if it doesn't. And may I say this one, serving the Lord is not hard. Its yoke is easy and its burden is light, I know, but even then, you're going to find that you can have friends that can kind of knife in the back. You can have a lot of problems. Sometimes you can get weary in the work, not weary of the work, but weary, tired. And I found that one thing that really helped, I'd sometimes get in my car, still do. I get on my motor then, and I'd drive out to the cemetery, buried the one up there in North Miami out there where the Zemans near where they used to live. We had a Bible study. Go out to the cemetery. Out there once a drizzling rain, just get him a car and go out and kneel by his graveside. Ah, he can't hear me, I know this. But you know, let me say this. I'd rather be Jim Tingen molding away in that grave with those purple pockmarks than I would be anyone sitting here in this audience when I stand before the Lord because I know this there are many people that are in heaven because of that boy and there isn't a person here in this room that doesn't have more intelligence than Jim Tingen had you could never stand before God and say well, Lord I just didn't have the ability I didn't have the talent to somehow let me say don't tell me that Ray I just couldn't bring them to the ranch I asked them but they wouldn't come Oh, friend, if Jim Tingen could get him out, I guarantee you, you could get him out. I'd hate to stand before the Lord with the abilities you have without ever getting a soul saved, without ever studying enough, without ever, without even caring enough. How many have parents here that are unsaved? Your parents are unsaved. Would you raise your hand? Raise them up. There's a lot of them. How many have quite a few friends that are unsaved? Raise your hand. I may say this. Perhaps the only ones they will listen to will be you. You have access to them. Your folks, you say, won't listen to you. I'll tell you this. If you do what I said to do this morning, if you honor your father and mother, and you'll go back and start doing some work around the house and making your bed and dumping the garbage and letting them know you love them and so on, they tell you this, they'll start listening. They'll start listening. 
whenever you love them well, so much you could just say, Daddy, I don't care if God takes my own life. I want you to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. I don't want to be separated from you. I, want, I love you. I want to be. That's some of the things. But let me say this. When you do it, you're going to find a love, a joy, and a peace you've never experienced before when your folks trust the Lord. I'd rather be Jim in that grave than the best-looking boy or girl in this audience. I'd rather my body be right out there rotting away right today than I would be anyone here unless you're really going to serve the Lord. Let's pray. And I'd be much better off. Friend, there may be some still unsaved. We're not asking you to do anything at all. No one's going to bother you. No one's going to have you for it. No one's going to embarrass you. We're talking about salvation at this moment. Would you receive Christ as a Savior? Just say, Lord, as a sinner, I'll accept a payment. I'm not saved. I don't want to call God a liar, though, anymore. I don't want to be a hypocrite and promise to do something. I just want to say I'm a sinner. I can do that honestly. And I can say, Lord, would you save me as a sinner? I believe you've made the payment for me on the cross. The Lord, I believe you made it for me. If the best you know how you want to trust Christ as your Savior that way, and no one will bother you, we'd like to pray for you. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, you just let it snow by hand. Would you slip it up right now and put it down? Are there any? Just slip up your hand. God bless you and you. Yes, there are quite a few hands. Awesome. God bless you. They're all over. Audience, yes. God bless you. There are many hands. Are there any others? Just indicate it by hand. Slip it up. Put it down. Oh, God bless you and you. Yes, there are many. Fine. God bless you, darling. And you over here and you, hon. Yes. There are hands. God bless you, sir. There are many hands. Fine. You all through? Any more? Last call. Flip it up, put it down. Any more? God bless you and you, yes, and over here, you. Amazing Grace. I was a little boy when I first heard that song. My grandmother sang it to me. But at the time, friend, I, I didn't know what his Amazing Grace was. It was just a song then. You see, I was taught the counterfeit of Christianity, that it was good boys that went to heaven and bad boys that went to hell, and that I'd better be a good boy. I had to be a grown man before I understood God's amazing grace. It was then that someone showed me Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It was a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. And the best I knew how I received the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who paid for all my sin. And friend, I know I have eternal life and that God would never kick me out or lose me because he loved me. That's this amazing grace. Why don't you receive that amazing grace right now? God bless you, friend. <laughs> 